Praise God. Woo. Wow. Praise God. You know, it's very special today because uh, Nina and I are so happy to be home with our own family and with the spiritual family for Chinese New Year. We always are away for Chinese New Year, but this year we got to be uh, home, although no service last week. This was, so this is the first service after uh, Chinese New Year. So Nina and I want to speak a very special blessing to all of you here or in Suntec, to our own spiritual family. It comes from second, uh, Third John, the second verse. Third John, the second verse. I pray that you may prosper in all things. Amen? Do you receive that? God wants to prosper us in all things. And then be in health. I think that's what we need. That, that's more precious than anything else, that you'll be healthy. And just as your soul prospers. So the prosperity is not just in everything, but in our health and especially in our spirit, in our soul. Amen? Amen? We have a very special message for you uh, this morning. Uh, I came back from Bogota. God did a special work in my heart. So uh, actually today, Pastor Roland is uh, scheduled to preach. I said, I'm going to preach. And Pastor Roland said, oh, hang on. I don't want to preach. <laughs> okay. One more week to rest. Uh, but he's going to come back and preach. So this message is entitled, Dreaming God's Dream. And the verse that I pray that God will inscribe upon our hearts is this promise of God in Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself also in the Lord, He shall give you the desires of your heart. Let's pray together. Lord, we quieten our hearts once again, and we invite you, the Holy Spirit, who wrote these words, inspired those words, to breathe life into this word and into this message, so that, Lord, every word that proceeds from this place will be words of life that will empower us, strengthen us, and release us so that we will see the abundance of life that you have promised us, experience for each of us, by each of us. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God impacted me with this word during the International G12 Conference in Bogota. And before I even go on, you know, this was one of those rare years that the Bogota Conference did not clash with uh, the Chinese New Year. And so we were able to bring 20 over people, uh, of course, some staff and many of the lay leaders to come. I wish I can line them up and ask them to give testimony, but I can tell you the impact upon them is incredible. And, and I want to invite all of you to set next year's date. Next year's date does not clash with Chinese New Year. You can finish it and still come back uh, for Chinese New Year, just that you've got to save up. It's a long journey over there. Uh, going to Bogota is to go to the utmost part of the world because uh, you look at the globe, it's like almost directly opposite. You fly for hours and hours, and, uh, and it's, but it's worth it because if you ask everybody when, they saw the impact of G12 around the world. The whole world was gathered, people in Europe, people in Africa, people in Russia, people in U, uh, US, people in Asia, every continent <coughs> is recommended and uh, is represented and they are so excited about the G12. People testify of how their lives, how they change, how their own lives are changed, how the church Churches are changed, and how the nation is impacted uh, because of the G12. This is amazing. But the special thing that God has shared with me took place in that first lunch that pastor threw for all the international pastors. And I went to that lunch, and that was like my first meeting with pastor then. And as I sat down, he began to speak to us, international pastor. And he spoke about dreaming a dream for the multitudes. He talks about the fact that G12 is not about 
three by three prayer, it's not about life training, it's not about destiny training, although everything there is important. But in fact, he hardly talks about all that. All these years I went, he always talked about dream, having a big dream for the multitude, about a dream, about winning a nation and transforming a nation. Now, I want you to understand this. I have heard pastor for 17 years. Every, I've been there for 17 years. And every year I go to the conference, inevitably he will talk about dreaming a dream. In fact, most of the time I don't hear him talk about uh, uh, attending live classes. Although those are important, we have a workshop and we'll be, these are the know-hows. But he talks about dreaming dream because that's the vision. The vision is about seeing the multitude and that you and I can impact the multitude and can transform the nation we are in. And he talks about that. And, and for 17 years he's always talking. And in fact, I hear him more than 17 times because when he comes to Singapore, he also talks about that. And, and that's it. And, and, and there again, after 17 years, I sat there and he comes out and he say exactly the same thing. Pastor has a, pastor has a habit. He preaches the same message until he sees people change. Can you imagine for the next three months, every week I talk about dreams? And same one, exactly the same message. He said, no point going to lesson two if you don't do lesson one. And that's what he does. He will agree with it until it catches and touches the life. That's, that's what he does. So he preached uh, the blood of Jesus for three years, okay, in his own church, until everybody become an expert in knowing the power of the blood. That's it. And, and that's what he does. He said, this is discipleship. So what he, he did, he said, I'm not here to entertain the crowd. I'm here to teach you what it means because it's not about the crowd and the visitor. It's about the people of God becoming disciples of Jesus. So I hear him talk about it for 17 years. And today, that day, he talked about the same thing. And it's the same illustration, the same story, almost the same thing. I almost can close my eyes and repeat what he's about to say. But God did something in my heart after 17 years. That's why I think he's right. He should keep talking about it until this thing registers. In fact, he's well known for the book, the first book that became internationally known that really impacted the world. It's entitled, Dream and You Will Win the World. Dream and you will, you can buy in Amazon. Uh, dream and you will win the world. And as I listened to the pastor challenging us to dream a big dream again, but for the first time, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. The Father in heaven said to me, Son, do you know that you have lost your dream for your ministry? Do you know that you have lost your dream for FCBC and for Singapore. Somehow the voice of the Lord was not a harsh rebuke. It was, it was a gentle prompting. It was coming from a loving father who jealously wants to guard the dream that he has birthed in my heart more than 30 years ago. It is like a father who said, don't give up what I have birthed in your heart. Because God understood that I did not abandon the dream because of disobedience or rebellion. It was because of the setbacks and the disappointments and the failures that I've experienced that caused me to begin to lose faith. And as a result of that, this dream is something I talk about, but deep in the very recesses of my heart, it has faded. It is not real. It is not what I used to be, believing in it. I feel like I ever have been. But the Lord woke me up in a new way. The next session, the next morning, pastor took the first session in the morning. And guess what he was talking about? He was talking about dream. Dreaming a big dream for God and for the multitudes. In fact, he got some of us to stand up and and, and, you know, he always, that's why I, I always must attend a session because somewhere if I tag one session, you say, where's Pastor Kong? Can you come out? So, uh, and then everybody said, hey, Pastor asked for you. So I'm always uh, uh, ready. But he brought in a number of international pastors. 
and you make us stand in front of the 10,000 seat auditorium and look at the crowd and he says, I want you to ask God for a dream and then he passed the microphone and asked me, asked each of us to articulate. Frankly, uh, last night I reported wrongly, Nina was saying, hey, you know, I, I said I'm going to dream that Singapore will come to no cry. I didn't do that because at that point I wasn't ready. But I, my dream was for China. So I articulated, I'm going to take the Christmas magic into every major city of China, inspire all the challenges, and I'm going to just bring in that culture of, uh, of Christmas, and one day the doors to give an invitation for the lost will be open, and I will go to every city again, and I'm going to see tens and tens and tens of thousands of these people coming to know the Lord. But anyway, that was something that was birthed in my heart. So God gave me this message today, entitled, Dreaming God's Dream. And right now, I want to share with you three very important truths that is going to change your life. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is going to lay hold of your heart, because if you understand these th three truths, and as you begin to dream a dream for the Lord, you will enter into the kind of abundant life that God has promised us. You see, when God saved us, He didn't save us just to go to heaven when we die. Of course, that's one of the most important things because we all are condemned because we're sinned against the Lord. But the Lord Jesus came and died for our sin and exchanged His life for our life so that His righteousness can be put into our life on behalf of us and, and that as we go to Him because all our sin has been placed upon Him. But He saved us not just to uh, have a a destination heaven because He placed us on earth and has given us a mandate to rule. He wants to restore humankind back to its original design, which was to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the whole earth and have dominion over the earth. Man is supposed to subdue the whole nature and govern the earth in such a way that brings down the reality and the presence of God. So, so I, I, I want you to uh, understand that this is what God wants us to do. So I just pray that when you do that and you enter into a dream that God dreamed for you and you begin to see that coming about in your life, you enter into what abundant life is all about. So I want to undergird in your heart these three important spiritual principles that I pray that the Lord will use to launch us into a life of dreaming a great dream for the Lord. It's time for you, every one of us to have a dream for the Lord and it's time for FCBC to rise up again with a dream for this nation and for Asia and for the nations around the world. Truth number one. Truth number one is this. We are designed to dream God's dream. Amen? God says you are designed, wired by God, created by God to dream a huge and big dream for God. We are people born out of design. And if you don't choose to live by design, we will end up with a life lived out of default. Let me say that again. If you don't live out God's design, you will live life out of default. You see, and it all begins with a dream. Not a plan, not a method, not a strategy, but a dream. A dream that is born of God. A dream that God has wired us within us before the foundation of the world, before we were born. This is what Paul meant when he said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared beforehand, before we were even born, before we even know Jesus Christ, for us to do. God wants us to live by what He has designed us to do. He wants us to dream, a dream that God has wired us to be to fulfill the Great Commission. And if you don't live by that design and that dream, you will live your life by default. What is living your life by default? It is living the way you have always lived, even before you come to know the Lord. Although you come to know the Lord, your sins are forgiven, but it's possible for Christians to just stop there and never live up God's design, but live by default, which is living according to the ways of this world, which is the same chapter, the earlier verses in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul said, as for you, you were dead in the 
your transgression and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. In other words, you can know the Lord, but your life just stop at there. All you do is that, thank you for forgiving me. And you kind of come to church and do your religious thing and feel like you have done everything. Instead of pursuing the dream of God, the good works that God has designed for us, so that we might enter into it. And when we do that, we are living by default, which is what we used to do. Follow the ways of this world. And what are the ways of this world? It is dominated by the ruler of the kingdom of the air. What is the ruler of the kingdom of the air? Satan himself. In other words, if you don't dream the dream of God, you may be a Christian, you may be coming to church, but you're walking according to the will of Satan. And the Bible says, and the spirit which is at work in those who are disobedient. In other words, Satan is not everywhere, but he assigned spirit, he assigned demons that would direct our ways so that we will never break out of what we were because we're living by default and we have by default surrendered the design of God for our life. And Paul reminded us that we were created in Christ Jesus when we give our life to Jesus, recreated. And in this recreation, God says He has designed for you a dream, good works that He has prepared beforehand that you will walk in it. In other words, when you become a child of God, there must be a dream shift in your life. All the dreams that you have, which is often molded by this world, orchestrated by Satan himself, work out in your life by demons assigned to you. I believe in, I believe in guardian angel. Do you believe that? I believe in guardian angel. Do you believe that there are demons assigned to you? I believe in that just to detract you, just to derail you, just to get you off the design of God. But when we really become a child of God and you want to walk as a child of God, there must be what I call a dream shift in your life. A dream shift is the transition of clarification of God's unique plan for us at our po as opposed to our own self-will desires and ideas. In other words, like Dr. Bill Bright. Dr. Bill Bright is with the Lord now. He started Campus Crusade for Christ and he, he is the one who wrote the presentation of the gospel called The Four Spiritual Law. How many of you have heard of The Four Spiritual Law? Some, some of you are you. Okay, it's not a tool that is used a lot. It's actually used by Campus Crusade for Christ. And the first thing we, we share with a non-Christian you know, when we share the gospel, we always share the gospel. It's like, oh, you've got to sin in your life. I mean, then people go, all right? So the first God and then Literally, hundreds of thousands of people, especially students, college students in his life has come to know the Lord because of the four spiritual law. And what is spiritual law number one? God has a wonderful plan for your life. That's what we tell people. That's the good news. You know, we tell people good news. That's good news, you know. you got to go to hell because you're a sinner. I mean, that doesn't sound very good news, but that's a fact, all right? But, but that doesn't sound good news. The good news is what? God has a wonderful plan for your life. Don't, we, don't you think this good news? Don't you think that most of us are always trying to find what's the purpose of our life? We kind of trip around and say, you know, do we just every day wake up, brush our teeth, eat our breakfast, have our lunch again, and then go to work and then come back? Or some of us get married, some of us remain, but it's just kind of a routine. But God has a wonderful plan for our life. A dream shift is that particular season when we come to know the Lord and when we encounter God that we are so delighted in God. It's a season of delight. It's a season of saying, wow, I have met God. That's why conversion is not just kind of praying a prayer. It's an encounter with God. And when you encounter God, you begin to delight in Him. And as you delight in Him, you find that your desires and dreams begin to change. And that's why Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of the heart. I suggest that we change one word in that verse. And I think it's exegetically correct. 
Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the dreams of your heart. The dreams of your heart. Now notice, it's not, it's the dream of your heart, not the dream of your head. How we look at desire is so important. We all have free will in this coming year to decide this idea or that goal or that thing to pursue. But how do we know that the dream we are going after is God's dream for our life? We begin to know that when we encounter God and when we begin to take delight in Him, we begin to realize that God is so much wiser and greater than us. But we realize that God loves us so much, He only wants the best for our life. Even as we go through difficulty, He only wants the best in our life so that we will enter into His abundance. And then we begin to live by faith and the dream begins to form in you and you begin to hear from God. Pastor Caesar is a man that is exemplified by living out this principle, that he believed that God has a dream for every one of us and it's the design of God. You know, Pastor Caesar, is am- his life is amazing. When he came to know the Lord, he actually saw Jesus Christ. That's how he came to know the Lord. Because people were witnessing to him, he was a Catholic, he's a Catholic background, but he's never had an encounter with God, doesn't know what it means to be born again. It's just a religious form that he has taken for years. But then, when people start to share with him about being born again and entering into the kingdom of God, one day he said, God, I'm going to test this out. So he told God, if you're real, tomorrow night at 9.30, I think it's 9.30 or 10, I forgot, I mean, that doesn't matter. Uh, He says, I am going to be in my living room And I'm going to sit there in my sofa and wait for you to show up. And I will not move until you show up. And that's what he did. He sat there. He says, God, I'm waiting. And Jesus walked through the front door and touched him. And he was never the same again. His heart turned around. He has a burning fire for the Lord. He felt the delight of the Lord. And then when he did that, his life was changed around. He wanted to uh, start a church. And so he started a church in his house. And, and, and it's amazing, okay? And he still have a job. Uh, he has a day job, but he started a church by faith. But his church never really grew. Never passed 150. His, his house is always jam-packed. I know this because I, I've been to Bogota long enough. I've talked to people that was with him in those days. In fact, uh, if you know Andrew Catano, the, you know, the interpreter, okay, his mother was one of the first converts or one of the first people that followed her, uh, followed him. And sometimes he has to move from house to house because, it, you know, it, it, the house was getting too, too small for the crowd. But she said that, you know, the anointing of God was upon him. I mean, even in a small living room, the power of God will come. People get healed. Demons start to scream and, and will be cast out. And, 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 but in spite of all the anointing, all the presence of God there, the church never grew to be 150. But one day, Pastor Caesar took a vacation in one of the most beautiful beaches at, uh, in, uh, in Bogota. So I think that's a good thing. Sometimes you should take a vacation. And, and, and he was just sitting in that beach chair and, and just looking at the ocean. And all of a sudden, he felt the presence of God. He heard God say, I'm here. I am the Ancient of Days. And as he heard that, he felt the presence of God. He entered into intense worship. And as he was worshiping God, he looked up into the ocean. And the shore, the sand of the shore begins to turn to people. And every grain of sand was become a human being. And all of a sudden, he saw the multitude. And God says, I want you to dream a dream of a big and huge church that will not only transform Bogota, but that will transform the world. And he said, I will, God says, I will bless you that your disciples will be like the stars in the heaven and the sand on the seashore. And 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 God began to, you know, deal with him. And he came back into his church. And his first dream was to pass 150. And he hit 200. And today his church is close to 200,000. 
I tracked with him for 17 years. He always does that. He always dream a dream. And when God gives him a dream, he pursues it and he believes it with all his heart. Today, he has a 10,000 seat auditorium that I was tracking with him in the whole process. In fact, our church helped uh, the uh, MCI a little bit financially. There was one point that if they don't put in this amount, you know, they're going to lose the whole deal. And, and, and we went on. So he brought me in when the whole auditorium was built, but there was no seats. It was pure concrete. He brought me in and we pray over uh, this whole auditorium and speak blessing uh, over it. Today, he owns a few blocks and, and it is right in the heart, the most central place of the city of Bogota, right in the heart, the busiest place. If you think of it, if it's a financial centre, you'll be Shenton Way. If it's just a shopping centre, you'll be Orchard Road. It's like Orchard Road and, 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 and Shenton Way combined. That's where it is, right in the heart, a, a, a few blocks of it. And I saw him every time he pursued, God would give him a word. There was a time where he sold his apartment and gave a million dollars because that was what it was worth. And he says, I give it so that he can have that deal. But God just began to, to do it. I see it. Today, they are planning to build a university in the church premise. And the mayor of the city of Bogota now is coming and say, can we partner with the government to build a huge complex where there's shopping, there's hotels, and, and there are things so that together, you know, we will bless the, the city of Bogota. He's an amazing man. In fact, every year he got some story of conquest, and his conquest is by dream, by dreaming it. And when God puts a dream, he pursues it and believes it. About two months before the uh, the conference, you know, God gave him a dream that he wants to build a mezzanine floor just behind the, uh, the stage of this auditorium so that the international pastors can gather. We used to have a little small place, but it was getting very crowded. International pastors like to kind of hang out with each other as they listen to the conference and, and watch some of the video behind. So it was getting crowded. He said, I want to build one that, that is really huge right behind and, uh, uh, so that the international, because G12 is a family, and I didn't, the reason I go back every 17 years, not just to, uh, for every year for the 17th year, is not just to listen to the message alone, but to be part of the family, people from Europe, uh, people from Paris, uh, what's the pastor's name again? Dominique, every time I see him, you know, this big guy, I say, Pastor Dominique, he believed God for Paris, for France, and he, he's actually not uh, living in Paris, he's living in French Guiana, and he and his wife would, would kind of go for three weeks and, this, and, and, and overlap one week, and the wife would go, and he said, we're going to believe God uh, for Paris. I, I need to hang around people like that who just would just give everything to see the multitude come to know the Lord. So he said, I want to build this. He went to the contractor. He said, I I want to do this. He, he gets someone to draw a rough sketch of it. He said, how long does it take? And the contractor said, Pastor, we need to strengthen, we need to do structural uh, modification to the whole building because it's a mezzanine floor and you will not hold that. So, so it's a big thing. We need to dig up the ground and you will take minimum of five months. And he looked at us and said, you know how I work. And he looked at the contractor, he said, you know how it works. God says, it will be done by the conference. There are only two months. I give you 52 days. 52 days is the number of days that Nehemiah built the walls of Jerusalem. If Nehemiah can build the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days, you can do it in 52 days. Why do you get three shifts of workers that will work 24 hours? Now, pastor said, I have no money in the church to do that. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. But God says so, so he do it. And guess what? We were there. 52 days is done. A beautiful place. And I tell you, uh, it's so good. Here's a man who really believed in it because he believed that we are wired to dream and that we got to dream God's dream. And then we will see God's dream begin to take place in our life. And that's what we are designed to do. And that's why He passes all of us. He disciples us and you need a dream. So He makes us stand up. I've, I've been to Colosseum with Him that sits uh, 20, 30,000, 50,000 people and He makes us stand there and say, look at this crowd and say, this is my church. My church will be like that. You know what I wish I can do? And I don't have a time because if you do that, we'll never go home today. But if I can get every every cell leader, every cell leader to walk up here and to look at this crowd. There's about uh, 1,300 thousand thousand two, thousand three about uh, that in this. And then you look, it says, my tribe. 
will be at least a thousand strong. If I can get every, every cell leader to look at this and say, God, I'm going to lay hold of this until I see a thousand people under me. I, I have about close to a thousand cells. Could you imagine if all of us believe in that? And they say, Lord, I'll knock on the gates of heaven until I see it. Isn't that exciting? You want to live by design or you want to live by default? I don't know about you, I want to live by design. I want to live by the dreams of God because I'm designed to dream. So that's number one, truth number one. You get it? We are designed to dream God's dream. Tell someone, you are designed to dream God's dream. Come on, tell it like, as if you mean it, all right? <laughs> now let's take to number two, truth number two. Why is it so important? Why is it so important? Number two, because it takes a dream to release your faith. The Bible says, everything will be done according to your faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. God is not moved by just our tears. God is not just moved by our needs. If God is moved just by needs, then, then the poorest country in this world will be very prosperous. But God is not. God is looking for men and women of faith. But how can we have faith? Faith is released first and foremost by a dream. If you want mountain-moving faith, you must have a mountain-moving dream from God. You know, we, we read the Bible, you know, Jesus said, if you have the faith as small as a seed, you can look at this mountain, be moved, and be moved. He said, well, all right, huh? why don't I try it? What for? God doesn't give us this just to say, oh, move here. Move here, you think about computer games, eh? You don't need mountain moving faith unless you have a mountain moving dream. That's why it's a dream that releases your faith. This has always been so, all through the scripture. Look at the great man of faith, whom the Bible says is a friend of God. His name is Abraham. And to today, God's Dream is being fulfilled. Israel is a blessing to the world. Today, Israel set the standard in technology. It's an amazing country, small as it is. But it began with a dream. Genesis 2, 1, and 3, uh, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I, this is what God says, will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Years ago, an apologist was asked, what is the greatest proof that the Bible is true and that the God of the Bible is true? He said, just look at the nation of Israel. Never in the history of humanity where there's a nation that has been destroyed close to uh, 2,000 years can form itself again into a strong nation. Amazing, small as it is. And all the nations want to attack them. They couldn't. Why? Because God said, who bless, who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. I will make you a great nation. And through you, the nation of the earth will be blessed. But that was not enough. So Abraham went out. But God kept fanning that dream. So that in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, the Bible says that God brought him outside, Abraham, and said, look. Now towards heaven, count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Now just think, think about it for a minute. God already said that. That's good enough. The Bible says so. But no, God needs to fan this dream. And God needs him to visualize. And Pastor always said, visualization is the language of dreams and faith. You've got to see it in your heart. You've got to see it as if it is so and it's done. So in order to do that, God took him out, took the trouble. I mean, God can just say it. He said, I'm God, I say it. But he said, no, take a look at the stars. Go and count them now. And he started counting and it's impossible. After a while, you lose count. You start again and you go and you go, you know, thousands upon thousands. He says, so shall your descendants be. So shall your descendants be. Back to the dream. 
Abraham had to pay a high price. Abraham don't even see it coming in his life, but, but the dream must be there. Genesis 22, verse 17. Blessing, I will, that was after the sacrifice of Isaac, and, and God sealed that covenant because he knows the heart of Abraham. Again, he said, Blessing will I bless you, multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. Your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemy. You see, I just want you to understand a pattern here. When God wants to stir up faith, He must give you a dream. It's a dream, it's a picture that God creates in your mind. If you don't have that, you can say, I believe, I believe. Believe in what? But it says, i, I got to see this picture, and it becomes real. What does the writer of Hebrews say in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is faith? Faith is that the things that you hope for, it has become substance. It's as good as it's already here, and it will come about. That's faith. Faith is not, I hope for the best. (laughs) Faith is, I know, it's done. Yes. It is what? Evidence of things not seen, see? People say, you know, seeing is believing. But the Bible says believing is seeing. When you believe the things that are not seen, you saw it. You saw it. That's why the man and woman of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 all saw the dreams of God. Listen to this. Verses 8 to 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place where he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Amazing faith, isn't it? All right, move everybody out. By faith, he lived as an alien in a land of promise. In a land of promise, he lived. Do you see that, that mountain, that, that uh, contradiction here? Okay? The alien in a land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Jacob and uh, Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same form, promise. For he was looking. Say the word, looking. See? He saw. He is looking. He's looking for the city which has foundation, whose architect and builder is God. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He heard the Word of God that there's a city that is going to be built by God, whose architect is God. And all these years in an alien land, in a foreign land, in living in tent, it's supposed to be a great nation. And he was looking because he saw, he saw all this. Hebrews 11 verse 13. All this die in faith. How come they get their faith? Without receiving their promises that the reality didn't take place. And having seen them, you see all that? Having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. In fact, the next verse says, they became men and women the world is not worthy of. Because there's a group of people who saw the coming of the king. So real that is as good as fulfillment because it has happened. Remember, I shared with you why this uh, this message, because when when, when pastors talk talk about dream, all of a sudden God said to me, you have lost the dream for Singapore and FCBC. And he wasn't rebuking me. He knows the pain I went through. And I'm just being bearing my heart with you. You see, do you know why FCBC grew to be from a, just a few hundred member church to 10,000 in about 10 years? Because of sale? Yeah, but not really. These are methods. Because of my preaching? Well, okay, I mean, I do a decent job, but, but there are better preachers than I have. I do. And I'm still preaching. I don't see this same level of growth. All right? And I'm still pre- I don't think I'm preaching worse than before. But I tell you what, because I have a dream for FCBC. I have a dream that FCBC will win Singapore for Christ. 
I have a vision for FCBC. And not only a vision, a dream, I believe it, I saw it, I know it. It's as if it is done. It is. And that was before I met Pastor Caesar, before I understand about visualization, but I already saw it. Because when this church was started, when we were just a few hundred people, I remember, I, God gave me a very nice apartment up on the top floor and I have a balcony that's double story and thankfully there was no b- building in front of me that blocked so I can see. In fact, I can sit in my, in my uh, apartment and see SLF building, right? We see it in that, in that direction. And you know, there I have dreamed so many dreams of God. I have written so many sermons. I have spent time with God. And, and in the start of the thing, I begin to ask God. I say, God, what kind of church do you want me to build in FCBC? Now, just remember, you know, sometimes I'm going to share you a dream that's so big, you say, wow, you know, can I do that? No. Sometimes it's in stages. God teaches us how to. By that time, I already pastored a church for more than 10 years. I pastored a church before I went for seminary training for about two years. And then in, 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 in Dallas, I pastored another church for about three years. And then I came back to my own church that I pastored it for more than five years. So, so about 10 years. And, and, and I said, God, what do you want? And God said to me, he said, son, if you have no restriction, you can have all the money you want. You can have all the resources you want. Tell me what kind of church you want to build. Write it down. And I wrote down the first vision of FCBC. I saw the island of Singapore. And I said, I'm going to build two networks. One network of community service. And that birth Touch Community Services. That was two, three years before, even more than that, before Touch Community Services were born. When Pastor Eugene came to me and said, God called me to do this part. All right? And I said, yeah. But I saw, I see a network everywhere just covering Singapore. All right, and then I saw another network of cells in every block covering Singapore, and that's discipleship and evangelism. And when we touch the community, and there's a group of disciples, and these two merge, we're gonna win Singapore for Christ. Now you may say that's too too arrogant. You know how can a church, one church, win Singapore for Christ? Well, I don't think so. I need all the churches. Hands love Singapore, but I God said to me. Everybody's job is nobody's job. You know, oh, win Singapore for Christ is every Christian job. So, therefore, I don't have to do anything. So, they become nobody's job. Somebody, one church had to say, if nobody is doing it, we will do it. We will stand before God, accountable to God for the salvation of Singapore. What does that mean? We don't really know. I don't think it's going to be 100%, but it's going to be such a significant thing that the whole nation is shifted Godward towards Jehovah. I had a dream. I wrote it down. It was a dream that I would build a, a school that would train pastors for the region. And we saw the dream come true. We had uh, seven schools, six or seven schools around the world teaching pastors how to do cell church. And then we're going to plant 50 churches by the uh, uh, end of 50, uh, uh, the end of 2000, 2001. And, and Pastor Caleb was a mission pastor. And he actually came at and said, we did that. We did that. Not every church is my church, but, but we help really small churches to become come you know, really a viable, uh, a growing church. And I had a dream. And that dream was so real that I shared with FCBC in those days. And the FCBC believed it. We said, we're going to plant in every cell and the members believe it. So much so that some of them said, so we have a map, you know, visualization. We have a map in our office. How many of you have seen that map before? Uh, I see a few hands. <laughs> we have a map. And then every time a cell is formed and the map with all the housing block, we put a dot there, we put a pin there and we see it grow. In fact, everybody believed in so much that some of them said, I just got married and we're going to, Look for our HGB flat. We're going to bid for our HGB flat. We will do it in a new town where there's no sale because we are going to start the first sale and we are going to fill every block with a sale. That was what happened. And so we had a dream. Then the cell helped us because it was a correct strategy. All right, it was amazing. But, but it wasn't the cell that made it happen. It was a dream. And every day I go to the office, I look at this map, and I see this dots growing, and I, I'm excited. Today we're going to do it again uh, and later. Now we don't need an actual physical map. We can actually have a, 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 on, the, on, the, on the cyberspace, you know. That's easier, you know. Okay. So well, we're going to do it. I mean, no kidding, this was what. And, and I believe it with all my heart. I saw it. It's as if it's done. 
until other churches start to believe in it. And that was the start of Love Singapore. I told Love Singapore, we do four, five things. Number one, unite the body through prayer. Prayer always unites us. Number two, serve the community with no string attached. You can see the, the, the network. That was both our FCBC. All right? Third, plant a cell in every block. And fourth, in the year 2001, we take all the cells in every block and start blessing that block and start sharing Christ with the block. And we're going to do a seven-wave harvest and we're going to see Singapore coming to know the Lord. Now, in looking back, I was a bit childish at that time. Uh, and later, i tell you why we failed, all right? But don't worry, we do that. And then fifth, every church will adopt a hidden people group and start planting churches. And I tell you, it took, it, it, you know, in those days, there was no such agenda on the, uh, on the horizon, in the landscape. That's why we packed out the indoor stadium with prayer meeting. You know, that's never seen. I mean, prayer meeting was always, even a national prayer meeting is just 200, 300, that's all. But we packed it up with, with, with 10,000 people, not to listen to a great speaker, not to have a great conference, not to be trained, but just to pray. And that was the beginning of the Love Singapore movement. Why? Because, and God showed me that. Your church grew because you dream and you saw that dream. But I lost it. And I'm not going to talk about it yet. That brings me to the third truth. All right? Truth number one, we're all designed by God to dream. Amen? Because God has prepared a dream for us. Good works that we have to Walk in it because he prepared it beforehand. Truth number two, why dream is so important? Because dream releases faith. And everything in our life is about faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it is all about faith. God is moved not just by our feeling. God is moved by our faith. But that leads me to the third truth. While dream releases faith, it takes faith to realize your dream. It goes in a circle. We can't have dream until we have, we can't have faith until we have a dream. And this dream so propelled us, so grab, grip us. You can't possess a dream. A dream possesses you. And you begin to rise up in faith. But as you do that, then you need to persevere in that faith until that dream is realized. It takes persevering, relentless, unmovable faith to realize your dreams. Look at the men and women who have dreamed from the Lord in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. The men of, of faith, the great heroes of faith. They all press in, in their faith, in the most challenging circumstances. Abraham lived in tents. Abraham was an alien, not accepted. When he died, he has to borrow somebody's tomb to even bury himself. It doesn't belong to him. Because every dream must be continually renewed, restated, repeated in our prayers, declared so that it's rooted in our minds, rooted in our hearts, rooted in our action, and a dream to drive us how we think and how we work. Last night's anchoring pastor is Pastor Melissa. The husband is Guan Han. They are, both of them are pastors. Melissa went through a difficult time. She had a miscarriage. And the second time she was pregnant, she has a stillborn. Stillborn is worse than miscarriage because miscarriage, you don't just see it as gone. But when you have to birth some, a child that is dead, in the womb, it's tough. And, I, and Nina and I felt so bad about that. So Nina and I decided to bring Guan Han. Guan Han wasn't a full-time pastor yet, and Melissa, of course, you know, I challenged him to respond to the Lord, you know, but, uh, but I just felt like they need some healing, they need some rest, they need some just, just getting away. So we, 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 we took them to Bogota. And at the end of that, both of them catch this idea of dream. Melissa came home for one year. Every day in her prayer time, he will, she would will talk to her womb and would say, you are going to give me a, a son. And in fact, God revealed that you will be a son. 
And then every day, she would talk to the son in the womb, every day. Hey, mommy's here. You're going to grow up strong. And you're going to be a blessing to this family. And you're going to be a proof that God is a great God of love. And every day she spoke that. Every day she visualized that. Every day she declared that dream that God put in her, in her heart. And after one year, Noah was born, the first boy. Now they have a second child. And so she testified that this dream works. You know, Pastor Claudia and Pastor Caesar, every year, and that's what we want to challenge as an application. Every year, they prepare a dream book. And in each page, one page will be about the church, one page will be about the international man, but she has a page for every member of the family, every daughter, every son-in-law. Now she has about eight, I think the eighth grandchild is coming, okay? And, uh, and she said, I have a dream for her. And, and uh, Pastor, Pastor Claudia is, a, uh, is an art and craft person. So she has this thick book, you know, and all, every page got pictures, la, got cartoon, la, got, you know, all sorts of things. But, but she said, oh, I look at this first granddaughter. I know she's going to be a great dancer. She's going to be in the arts. And Lord, I, I see that she will be used greatly. And I declare that none of the things of the world is going to take her away into deception, but she will form a new influence in the arts. This person, you know, is so good. She's going to be a scholar. And I believe that you will give her. And I tell you, and she dreams. And every day, she said you would take, every year she would take about one month before the dream book is finished because she just needs to prayerfully ask God for the dream and every year she would do that. You know, a dream will release faith but it takes that dogged, determinant, uh, relentless faith to press in. This is why the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 says, we got to fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul says you need to have faith, but you need to fight the good fight of faith so that you are always taking hold of the eternal life. You say, why must we... Take hold of the eternal life. The eternal life is yours. Yes, it's yours, but it's not yours because you don't live it out. So therefore, all through the life, you're fighting. Life is a fight so that I will not go back to the world. I will take hold of the faith and lay hold of that good faith that God has put in our heart and lay hold of eternal life so that my life will have good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Why? Because Paul says, we are fighting not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Why? Because there are demons on every level set to rob us of God's dream. And we must fight the good fight of faith. Now, I want to I settle one issue that I, I want to keep, I, I keep settling this. You know, every time, you know, there are people who leave our church, and it's okay. Because we are called to build disciples. True disciples, it's tough. You need to fight. You need to fight every day. But there are many people who say, oh, you see, that's not, you need to have a restedness. You know, I, it's not from one sector, everybody. You know, our trouble in our churches, we just, we just fight and fight. Oh, we're so tired. We just could be rested. We, we shouldn't feel so pressured. You know, because where the Spirit of God is, there should be liberty. And, and I can tell you, this kind of teaching is not biblical. Not only is it not biblical, it doesn't produce spiritual greatness. It does not produce spiritual greatness at all. But it's good. People like to hear it. So recently I was told of a sermon that, that uh, some people was listening to by a particular preacher about Solomon and David. And in and, and this sermon, it says that, you know, the reason God chose Solomon to build a temple is because he's a man of peace. You see, we want peace. Whereas David could not build a temple because he's a man of war. So God was happy with Solomon because Solomon, you know, has that restedness. You don't understand restedness. I tell you what is restedness. Restedness is right in the middle of the war where everybody's dying and you're about to die and you are rested. Now that's restedness. 
Okay, if you are lying on the floor in a beach and the wind is blowing, you know, and then you have you're sipping, you know, your your coke and uh, and you feel uh, only a mad person is not rested. Okay, I tell you what is restedness, and is that thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and my cup runneth over. That's restedness. Get you to a place that you can die anytime, and you say, Hallelujah. That's what I made for. That's restedness. All right? I got a lot of illustration like for my polo. Restedness is what? This guy's taking you off your horse, banging you, and, and everybody's doing, and right there you take him off, and now you've got a ball, and you just restedness. <laughs> and the ball will fly. If you go there, yeah. We call killing the snake, you know, the ball will not fly. You understand? Have you thought about golf? Golf is all about restedness. It's about after three days of tournament and you are just one stroke down to go and this is the opportunity. And, and, you, and if you stand there and say, I've got to hit it well, man. I go, You're not going to hit it. You go... I want restedness. I can tell you. You want restedness? You learn it in a war. I'm telling you this. But I want to say to this, this is totally wrong theology. Solomon could not build a temple if David was not a man of war. He fought the kingdom. But I know God says, visually, I want someone that is not associated with all this war so that my temple is always associated with peace. That's, I understand that. But God never called Solomon a man after his own heart. But David was known to be a man after his own heart. And the book of Psalms says, after he has served this generation, he found his rest with his forefathers. And he was taken away. Not Solomon. Solomon wasn't pleasing the Lord only for a moment when he asked for wisdom. But the next thing you know, the success got to him. And then he was known for all his, all his wives. And he set the stage when he died. The kingdom split and he never came back again. I want to tell you, David is the man that God treasures. He's the one who fulfilled God's dream in his generation. But listen, listen to David in his struggle. Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2 and verse 6 and 8. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? You know what this, this David, he goes and says, God, where are you? Why don't you listen to me? And I'm from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, you do not hear. And in a night season, I'm not silent. Verse 6 to 8, But I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach of man despised by people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lips. They shake their heads, say, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him. And since he delights in him, but I'm poured out like water, and my, all my bones are of joy. My heart is like wax. I become jaded. I become so burdened. This is the man after God's own heart. Now you say, wait, 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 wait. This psalm is actually a messianic psalm that talks about actually the struggle of Jesus. Because you remember Jesus on the cross, he said, God, God, why have you forsaken me? You see, it is fulfilled in, in the Messiah. But that David doesn't know it when he wrote it. God used it as a messianic psalm, as a prophecy. Prophecy always like that. Sometimes you don't even know it. But he's saying, God, help me. My enemies surround me. Now, you say, no, 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 no. This is the Old Testament. Old Testament, Jesus didn't die. In fact, Jesus came and do God's will. He had a dream of the redemption of the world. I mean, that's what he did. He said, God, why have you forsaken me? He has to fight the fight of faith. Oh, but that's after Christ. After Christ is different. It's all about grace. It's all about oh, restedness and joy. In. Listen, listen. Let's look at Apostle Paul. Let's look at Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul had a dream. At the end of his life, he said, I was not disobedient to my heavenly vision, to my heavenly dream. And this is what he did. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. Are they servants? I'm out of mind. I am more. Now, just give you some context. He's fighting people who are attacking him. Other servants of God 
who said that Paul is nothing like he went to jail, that he must have sinned against God. You know, a good man will never go in there. Okay, we are the servant of God and he has to defend himself. He says, if they are servants, and he said, I must be, oh my, I mean, I, I'm stooping to their level, but, but anyway, I'll do it, okay? But I'm more. Let me give you my credentials. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, flogged more severely, exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews a 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from river. You know, this, he's telling his credentials. He said, my credentials are this. I've been to China in those days of revival. You know what that credential is? They will compare. You know, how many years have you been in seminary? Their seminary means, when they say Sun Shui Yuan, means prison. They say, oh, you five years. I 10 years left. <laughs> I 10 years. All right? So, so he goes and he says, I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from our own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brother. That's the one I like. Okay? That's why in, in Love Singapore, when we first started, our fellow pastor, we don't call each other brother. Because every one of us have been hurt by brothers. You know, hi, brother. And they go, oh. So after a while, we even scared to call each other brother. Say, we don't call each other brother. You know, now that hi, bro. You know, and uh, uh, we don't call each other bro anymore. We just say, hey, let's be friends. Okay, <laughs> maybe that's a fresh idea. Uh, uh, you know, maybe we're overreacting, but okay. I've labored and toiled, have gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst, and have gone without food. I was cold and naked. And I got, let me believe me, when all these things happen, he's not going. Oh, I'm really having a great time. You know, it's great. He's having a hard time. And let me tell you this. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure. He lives in pressure. Daily pressure of my concern for all churches. In fact, you can take all this. You know why? You got a dream from God and your dream is so big that he creates a mountain moving Faith so that you can handle all the pressures. But you will be under pressure. In fact, when he wrote Second Corinthians, he said, when we were in this place, we almost despair of our life. We want to take away our life. We want to cry to God and say, kill us. We can't take it anymore. Yes, God's dream will release faith in us. However, we must continually allow faith to work in our life because it takes that kind of faith. That's what I'm training you guys. The kind of tenacious Fearless, fighting faith that press in only for the dreams of God. The kind of faith that will realize that dream. Now listen to me. Now I share with you why I lost my faith. That was my problem. I lost my faith in 201. Some of you know. I said 201 is going to be such a great harvest. And, and the whole Singapore will come to know the Lord. In fact, we debate, is it 60%, 80%, 90% and so forth. But it didn't happen. We booked the national stadium. It was not, only, it was not even half, half, half filled. It was maybe a quarter filled. All right? Many things happened. One of my best friends who is a pastor committed adultery, divorced a wife, married someone else, another faith. I mean, that really blew me out of the water. I mean, that really kind of shook me up. These are my core leadership. It, it broke my heart so bad. I mean, you cannot believe it. That, that I know he did that, and I just pray that he will confess his sin. So I sat down with him for four hours just to talk with him. And he didn't know that I knew, but I keep giving him an opportunity to confess. And he lied to me again and again in my face. And that broke my heart. I'm not just blaming it on him. I mean, that's one of the things that happened. After a while, I realized that people like to jump on a bandwagon, but when the rubber meets the road when it cost them something, when you need to go, they didn't go. So, it was half year. I, I, I went up to a pastor during that, that one of the night meetings. I said, how come your church didn't show up? I mean, this, this guy could have, you know, brought thousands of people. He said, oh, this week, our office is moving. And that just confounded me. We've talked about this for six, seven years. We've talked about it the whole year. The dates have been booked. 
we we'll say we're going to do it. And you move office this week. <laughs> it is incredible. And I, I tell you, I went away. But, but I went away most painful, not for these people who just say they will do it, but they didn't do it, but people who really believe in me. You know, I can tell you, Victory Family Center is one of them. Rick Seward, they really, he came behind it. The other one is Pastor Derek Hong from Church of Our Savior. He came behind it. In fact, at the end of 201, he looked at me and said, Pastor Kong, ni hai su wala. Because our people believe it. In fact, some of our people believe it. And in fact, some of his church believe that the revival will come. Some of them actually quit their job, ready to be a pastor. Because when the harvest comes, they say, I want to pastor the church. But it didn't happen. And, and, uh, and last, this year, Pastor Suppress Amir is very good. I interview all of them. And Pastor, Pastor Derek said, I follow you. I, I mess up my church. You know, I da, 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 da. So he tell everybody. And then I say, that's, that's terrible, Derek. But why are you still around? <laughs> and he said, because I believe this from God. I believe it. <laughs> and, and you know what? Now, the young, the young pastors are coming to talk to me. They said, I, I want this kind of authentic relationship. You know, it will never happen in an official uh, denominational setting. Everybody knows their role. They will never, you know, oppose the ball. I mean, not that, you know, they, they just do. But this is a relationship. We, we just, we, we, the people who track with me, you know, uh, uh, they just will say, you're the man. All right? So, so whatever. I, I was so brokenhearted, all right? So I resigned actually as a chairman, although I, we were never out of Love Singapore. Pastor Eugene was in the team and we just keep supporting. And then seven years later, they asked me to take over, but that's not what I want to talk about. But, but that was a very painful experience. And, and I went on to other things. You know, you know me, I'm, I'm the kind who is very stoic, you know. Now let's see, found the xia. All right, never mind. Let's go on. You know, let's, let's, uh, and I start taking arts and entertainment. I still believe in, in Singapore. But you know something? I lost that dream, the belief that Singapore can be safe. Whatever definition it would be. All right? And, and I really don't realize it. I just kind of, it become, you know, I just kind of forget about it and just move on. And until this end of this, this year, Bogota conference, and the God says, you know something, you talk about it, but you don't have the same faith. You lost that faith. And God just knew what was going on. Now, I'm sharing that with you, uh, not to complain. In fact, we look back. So, so I actually, you know, realized that. And I, I couldn't say much. So finally, one day, in between session, when pastor was at this mezzanine floor, and Bert Pretorius and uh, uh, some of my brothers, you know, like Art Sapavada, together with Daniel Kong, my wife, we all gathered around pastor, and I began to ask pastor, pastor, you know, this, this year when you're speaking, I found that I lost my faith, and I explained to him 201, it was such a letdown. In fact, it was something that, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't even process with my church, you know, that I just went on. I didn't sit down and say, what is happening, what can we learn? You know why? I don't know how to process it. I got no answer. And I was filled with guilt. Maybe I, I hear God wrongly. Maybe i too childish. Maybe i too dominant. I, and just try to bow over everybody and they just flow along. Maybe, you know, I, I just didn't uh, pastor uh, some of these pastors in the city well enough and, and, and so forth. So whatever. So, so I, I just, I, I have no answer. I, you ask me, I have no answer. So I just go on. But something happened to me. I dare not believe again that Singapore can be safe. So I shared it with Pastor. I said, this is how it, 201 was such a letdown. And Pastor looked at me and he said, you know, that's the problem. When God gives you a vision, never set a date. You know, we are very good at setting dates, okay? People always set dates. You know, have you heard of people when Jesus is coming back again? You know, say, and, and the disciples love to set dates. When Jesus was resurrected, teaching them in the 50 days, uh, the disciples uh, asked him, is it now that you're going to fulfill the, the kingdom? All right? I mean, they always want dates. And God says, this is nothing to do with you. This is in the heart of the Father. You know, it is kept secret. No, you don't need to find out the dates. But wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit and you shall receive power 
When the Holy Spirit come upon you, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to Amun's father world. Keep pursuing the dream. Keep believing in the mission. Keep being empowered and get, keep going, but forget about dreams. And, and he reminded me, and it makes sense. You know, Abraham never saw it, but three generations later, all right? And, and it's amazing. So, so the Lord said, is it, Pastor Kong, just forget about it. He was wrong, all right? But I want to say this to you. The dream to you never died. God's dream for you is still the same. You're going to believe God The Singapore will be one for Jesus Christ. Why? Because the calling and the gifting of God is irrevocable. He shared with me, he says, you know, Pastor, I don't talk about this often, but I've seen Jesus himself. In fact, Jesus in one occasion, has taken me up into the very throne room of heaven and I saw the angels and the worship and so forth. And then I came back just fired up for God. But, but you know, I always ask God, God, why can't I go and see this again? God says, not necessary, once enough. <laughs> All right? And God is saying, when He gives you a dream, that's a dream for your life. That's the dream that He wants you to pursue. So go and pursue the dream. Hence, this message. I'm just telling you this, that... I lost that dream. And you know, when you lose that dream, the things you do becomes meaningless. And that's what happened to FCBC. Because I don't dream, you won't dream. You won't see it. And because you don't see it, wow, another activity, another, another harvest event, and a tree by tree, okay? And uh, uh, we have to do this training and that training. But all this become meaningless and you become drained and you become tired. You become tired because there's no dream behind you. The fire of God is not there. The dream, the passion inside you is not there. But I want to declare that today God wants us to dream again. Amen? God wants us to dream again. Like Pastor Claudia, have a dream book. I want you to go and have a dream book. Have a dream book for yourself. Write down every member of yourself and start dreaming. Write down the worst guy. You know, the guy who's always come late, always complain, always never show up, always do already, still complain and cause division. Now you dream. You dream that he's going to be a great man of God. He's going to have a dream of God and his life is going to change around. Start dreaming that dream. Isn't that what God does? He did that to Gideon. You know, Gideon was a big coward. The Midianites were around. He did not want to show up in the public. He hid in the wine press to, to beat his wheat, you know, to win over this. Something you do in the open where there's wind to blow away the house. He does it in a confined place. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, You valiant warrior of God. And this guy go, Huh? Me? Where? I, who are you? Me? But that's what God does. He looks at the most broken person here and he says, you're a great man of God. The man who is living in sin but rescued by the blood of Jesus, he says, you pray, you repent. You know why? Because you're a great man of God. You're a great woman of God. You're going to have a great family. You're going to have a dream for your, for your spouse. Stop scolding your spouse. Stop, you know, nagging about why he or she is not what she is. Have a dream and say to your spouse, you are a great person. You are a man or woman of God. You are crowned with God's love and compassion and righteousness. And you're going to see the faith begin to rise and God is going to respond to that faith. Let me end with this. Recently, I just read again a, a story that Dr. Charles uh, Swindell. I, I love to read Charles Swindell's book. For years, I always buy his books and read. And he has this story. And this story goes like this. Legend has it that a man was lost in the desert, just dying for a drink of water. He stumbled upon an old shack. As he glanced around, he saw a little shack nearby, but there is a pump next to the shack. He stumbled over it, grabbed the handle, and began to pump up and down. Nothing came out. Disappointed, he staggered back. Then he noticed an old jug. He took it, wiped away the dirt and the dust, and then he read a message that said, you have to prime the pump with all the water in this jug, my friend, so that the water will come. You know, you must create the siphon effect. P.S., be sure you fill the jug again before you leave. He popped the cork, and sure enough, it was almost full of water. Of course, stale water had been there for 
I don't know how long. Suddenly, he faced a decision. If he drank the water, he would live. But if he poured all the water in the old pump, maybe it would yield fresh, cool water from deep down in the well. All the water he wanted and the water he needed for the rest of the journey. He studied the possibility of both options. Should he pour it into the old pump and take a chance on fresh water or should he just drink what is in the old jug and survive? Reluctantly, he poured all the water into the pump. Then he grabbed the handle and began to pump, and nothing came out. But then as he began to pump, a little water to began to dribble out, and then a small stream, and finally it gushed. And to his relief and, f- and refreshment, he had all the cool water he can drink and filled up his own water bottle with this for the rest of the journey. And then he decided that he will fill up the next jug for the next traveller. He popped the cork back and added this little note. He says, believe me, it really works. You have to give it all away before you can get anything back. Are you going to ask God for a dream where you're prepared to give everything away in order to realise the dream that God has given to you? Are you willing to risk your time, your identity, your life? You know, when I start to rally the churches in Singapore for unity, it was a joke because my credential is I was fired from a church and I was one who split the church. And for me to do that is like, it's like ironical. But are you thirsty enough today for the great things God has for you to take some risk? Let me come back to the verse and I'll finish. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall give you the dreams of your life or of your heart. Without a dream, doing G12 is meaningless. The three-by-three prayer is meaningless. It's only a chore. It's not done in faith because it's a dream that keeps our faith alive and all these things meaningful. The life classes, the destiny training, they're all just methods and strategies that have no life. But it's a dream that keeps the fire going. It's a dream that stirs up the faith that makes everything come alive. And this weekend, I'm calling, and as I was sitting there, I just thought about this. You know, I have a number of people that come to me, good, good leaders, I mean, in a very nice way, come to me and say, Pastor Kong, will you reconsider not doing the, the prayer tower? Because it's not happening here. Some, some, some of this time, people just go there and mumble and mumble, and, 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 and it's so hard to keep it going. And seriously, I consider this, you know. But it's very interesting in Bogota, I got the answer. One day, the pastor was talking about this, out, out of the blue, he just shared this. He said, years ago, I saw a vision. And in a vision, I saw demons coming up to devil, Satan, and giving a report and these demons were assigned to destroy Pastor Caesar's life and family. And, and, and the demons reported that, Pastor, you know, this man is really seeking God. It's very hard to attack him. But I realized that in 24 hours, there are these time slots that nobody is praying for him. And so Satan was assign a big troop of demons in those hours when nobody was praying for him to attack him. And he woke up and that weekend he went up to the church. He says, I need 24 hours prayer covering. I need all of you to do that. To come to church, have a 24-hour vigil for my family. Just not even for the church, for my family because the devil wants to take me out. You see, if the devil takes him out, the whole church is affected. And so we got to go 24 hours. And he did that for about a month, and within about slightly, just, just about a month, there was an assassination attempt on him. One day after church, it was Sarah's birthday, they decided to go for lunch. They were driving, and they stopped at a red light. A motorcycle came out with a machine gun and shot him point blank, and the whole family. He struggled for his life for years, uh, for, for months, sorry, in Miami. And he came back, he still got a bullet, sometimes he prove it, he said, this is my, my proof of apostleship, you know, uh, look at this bullet. 
All right? and, and he said, you know, from that day onward, the church understood how important it is. It is not just about, so some people have suggested, why don't we just gather more people in the evening on a more regular basis to pray? He says, no, 24 hours. Let me say this to you. We need to pray 24 hours. Even if it's tough. Even if we just left with one person who just sit there and say, God, I'm here to pray. And sometimes talk halfway, don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but Lord, I'm here to pray. God sees our heart. You think our prayer is very clever, then God says, oh, I'm convinced, you know. <laughs> now I answer your prayer. He said, Lord, I'm here. I'm here to uphold the church, to pray for Singapore, but I'm here to pray for my pastor and the family. Anything can happen to us. Pray for our marriages. Pray for, you know, I just, I was just thinking, I said, I wish I show a picture of Daniel when he was young. He's like that. Okay, I think he has shown it before. You know, you wear a Mexican hat, he looks really, you know, recognize him. Why? Because he has such a bad asthmatic attack that we need to nebulize him every two hours. Yeah? He needs steroids. Uh, he steroids and then we need to nebulize him. High dose of steroids and, and this, you know. And, and, and we, we, we are attacked again and again. You never know. I mean, one day, if I just announced that Pastor Nina and I, we're going to divorce, what's going to happen to you? You never know. The pressures that comes, the, the struggles we have in the family and, and all these things. Sometimes you just flip. I am surviving on your prayers. And so I'm just saying to you, we can close it. But it's, it's not the same. We've got to press in. Why? Because God has given us a dream, a big dream that releases faith, but we need dogged, determinate faith. Whether you like it or not, you stand there and say, God, I uphold my pastor, my his family, this church, and a dream that God has given to us, and we will lay hold of this again and again. Even we are tired, even we are falling asleep. You know, this weekend, the call to FCBC is, let's dream again. Your pastor, I've asked God to forgive me. And I said, Lord, I'm going to dream again. I'm going to see it. And you know, I start to share the love Singapore pastor. And, and you know why? Suddenly, after 17 years, then God reviewed this. How come God didn't review earlier? You know why? Because next year, 2819, for the first time, National Council of Churches, together with the Festival of Praise, together with Love Singapore, we're going to do the Celebration of Hope, which is in the, in the National Stadium. We have not done it for years that we're going to believe for Grand Harvest. All right? And we're going to do that. Now, we're not going to say the whole nation is going to come, but we're going to see something important. You know why we're doing it? Because we sense that this year is the 40th year since Billy Graham spoke in Singapore, and when Billy Graham spoke in Singapore, you should see some of the video. I mean, there were about 300 over 1,000 people that came and heard, and there were tens of thousands of people who came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and some of them now are pastors today of the next generation. And I tell you this, and somehow God has spoken to people in different realms and said, this is the time. But we're not going to just have a big harvest next year. We're going to have a year of prayer. So this year, we're going to have a momentum conference where we talk about prayer. We're going to have about 40 days of prayer and fasting. We're going to learn to fast as a church. And I'll teach you uh, more about fasting uh, when, I have a ch when the next chance I, I have to preach. Of course, I can always say next week, but I'm away next week. But, uh, but I'm going to teach you about this. But this time in this 40 days, we are going to have four regions. We're going to have four churches during these 40 days. They're going to switch around different churches, but that actually we invite people to go there and pray. And then we're all going to come together in the day of His power. We have booked the indoor stadium. And then we're going to have a national day of fasting called Seeking the Welfare of the Nation in the National Stadium, October the 7th. For three hours, we're going to pray for the welfare of the nation. We need to pray for the welfare of a nation. Why? Because there's a change in political leadership that's coming around. We just need to know that God will be merciful and put the right people 
in place. We've got a time where we've got to defend the family, the natural family. And in the last 45 minutes at least, we're going to have a thousand couples exchanging vows. We're going to declare one man, one woman, one husband, one wife, one life, one generation, and one heart and one mind. We're going to have a thousand children because it is the weekend of the children's day. And they are going to see their parents and they're going to speak blessing. We're going to speak blessing on the next generation because only the natural family is productive and is a blessing to the nation. The other alternative are not. So we're going to do that and we're going to praise about the big harvest. The welfare of the nation is that tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people are going to come to know Jesus Christ and we're going to do that. And, 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 and it's not going to be just the whole nation coming to know the Lord, but there will be such a breakthrough that faith will arise and there is a new day, a new atmosphere, understand? And you know, I started, and I'm going to share this with Love Singapore. I've been sharing in Love Singapore leadership. I've been sharing everywhere I go. You know, this is really our swan song for leadership of my age. People like Bishop Rennes, people like Lawrence Kong, people like, you know, Derek Hong. And uh, we, that's it. I, uh, that's the... Uh, we need to pass on the next generation. And the best thing we can pass on the next generation is what? It's a dream. It's a dream that a former generation have. They continue to go on and that dream is going to stir the next generation into faith and it's going to pass on to the next generation. Why? The time is now. That's why God spoke to me, not because of just me, but because of what is at stake that we're going to make disciples and FCBC will rise up again. Pastor... Pastor Caesar rebuked me. I said, I want so much unity. I said, God, use every church in Singapore even if they become bigger than mine. I'm willing not to be the biggest church in Singapore. He looked at me and said, why? You should ask God to make FCBC the biggest church. Oh, the sense of competition. No, 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 no. I realize now. You know what? How to stimulate each other good work if you're a pastor in our church. I want to be a bigger church than you. But we are such brothers when we're bigger. He will say, wow, good man, Pastor Lawrence. I tell you, I'm going to be bigger than you next year because I'm going to win more people to Christ. This is called, you know, it's like, it's like playing games. You know, good friend playing, playing a squash or soccer. Wow, you beat me this time. Huh? Next time I'm going to beat you. But we're not, we're, we're not trying to outdo. We're just trying to stir each other to love and good works. Understand? Okay? Is that better or is that... Oh, you lose, uh, that's good, no? Helps you with humility. And then, uh, next time, I'll lose again. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I'm going to do better than you. And then, when you do better than me, hallelujah, let's go on. And I, uh, let's, let's do, let's defend. That is really comradeship. That's really unity. You know, instead of saying, how can you be bigger than me? You're proud. No, I'm excited. So, you know what? I declare, FCBC will become the biggest church in Singapore. Because it takes this kind of faith to take the nation. And I pray that someone say, no, I will be bigger. It's okay. And then we're going to win this nation. Because it's about God's dream. You understand that? You know, God is so good to us. God is so good to this nation. He's jealous for our destiny. There was a prayer meeting in Penang of a group of intercessors from all different nations in Asia, Philippines, Thailand, and so forth. And they were seeking the Lord, and nothing was happening until, I think he's a Filipino, I, I, I can't remember, Pastor Eugene told me that, stood up and lead in a prayer and cried out to God because it was time to pray for Singapore. And he cried out to God and said, God, give us the Antioch of Asia, which means Singapore, because that's a prophecy. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit came upon the whole place. And people just felt the presence of God and prayer began to rise. And they prayed that Singapore will become the Asia of uh, Antioch of Asia. You know why? Because if Singapore does that, it will become a blessing. You see, Asia needs the different country to rise up in their dream, in their God's given role. And when we rise up to be what it is, it's a blessing. So the other nations is pleading that we will rise up to become the Antioch of Asia. And when nobody does it, FCBC will dream that dream. And if we are not fulfilled in our generation, I'll pass it on to the next generation, Daniel Kong. And if it's not fulfilled, Daniel will pass it to the next generation. But we're going to believe that Singapore will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Shall we stand? I want us to worship the Lord for a minute. And I want us to listen to the Holy Spirit. To ask the Holy Spirit to give you a dream far bigger than yourself. You know what? It's going to cost you your life. You have to give everything away. You have to pour that jug of water into the pump before that abundance of pure water will come in. The water is there. The water is Jesus Christ. He is the rock. He is the salvation. He is the living water. <clears throat> but that we need to just say, I enter into your dream. I'm talking to a, a whole group of people. There are some older Christians here who have been in our church for a long time. And you're just tired. You're just kind of, ah, I tried so many things, don't seem to work. Well, tell me about it. I know too. But the Bible says when the Holy Spirit is poured out, old men will dream dreams. You know, it's very hard for old men to dream dreams. You know why? Because we have so much setback, so much baggage after years of serving the Lord that sometimes we're not like that blue eye boy that just come into the ministry and say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to win the world for Christ. But you know what? The Bible says, unless you will be like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. So you know what? I want to ask God that I will become the innocent blue-eyed boy and say, God, you said so. I'm going to follow you. Yes. But at least I can pass that on to the next generation as a legacy that will create faith that will be mountain moving. So let's worship the Lord with this song. I think it's a very meaningful song as we do this. We're going to have a moment just to ask God to birth in us a dream, a dream for the nation, a dream for yourself, a dream for your life. So as the music plays, I want us to be silent before God. And will you ask God to begin to deposit in you a dream. A dream that is so big that it takes mountain moving faith. But some of you just started in your Christian life here. You're not going to say, oh, I'm going to win 100,000 people for Christ. You know, God knows where we are. So God is going to put a dream in your heart for this year. And God is going to just help you to understand the power of this dream because it's going to stir up faith and then as you do that, as you dream, your dreams get bigger and bigger because you realize how great this God is and how marvelous our Savior is. So you don't need to compare. Perhaps to everyone, today the application is we're going to go back and start developing a dream book for everything that you're concerned about. Then for your career, for your life, for your health, for your spouse, for your children, for your cell members for yourself and say, Lord, I'm going to look at this dream and I'm going to articulate it. I'm going to declare it. I'm going to reinforce it. And I'm going to ask God for the faith that could equal this dream so that we can move the hand of God. Because it's God that fulfilled the dream. We can't do it. It's not just by working harder. But when we are stirred up by God, we will work because God empowers us. And I want you to do that. But can you start right now? If God say. If God has touched you with this word, it doesn't matter you fail. I fail. We are flesh and blood. Someday when the glory of God comes, none of us, including myself, will there to say, oh, it's because of me. But you know, God is so gracious. He will always let us dream again. And that dream is irrevocable. So let's press in and start dreaming. So just for a minute or so, Ask God to begin that dream. And sometimes God might just put a dream in your heart. Some, sometimes God might rekindle a dream that God has given to you. If God has given you a dream that was real to you, it is not revocable. God has that for you. Start pressing in right now. So as the music play, just ask God. I just give you a minute just responding to this word.
Open their eyes, oh God. Open their spiritual eyes to see a dream. You know, some of you struggle when there's a thought that comes to your mind. We are in the presence of God. You always struggle. Is that God's dream? It's just my desire. But you know, when we take delight in the Lord, your desire and God's dream just come together. When this church was built, God actually asked me, what is your desire? If you have no limitation, what would you like to do? And often, that desire is God's dream in our heart. So, so stop arguing that, otherwise you'll never find it. And, and if you're wrong in some way, God will correct it. He's always able to do it. But now just, just tell God the desires of your heart. It's going to take everything to make that dream come true, faith. And those in Suntech too, God is moving. Don't just live life by default. Don't live life just like everyone else, the ways of this world. It's okay, God will prosper us, but, but, but it's not just for that. It's just for God's dream to be fulfilled. Now I'm going to pray for you. Those, who, those of you who say, Lord, I want to dream again. I want to have a dream for the kingdom of God to come, for the revival of Singapore, for thousands who come to know the Lord. If that, for disciples, that I will make disciples more than I could ever imagine. If that's who you are, raise both of your hands. I want to speak a word of blessing. Raise your hand because you mean it. You say, I want to dream. I want to dream that dream, that dream of God. Lord, I want to pray for those just like me who has been disappointed, setbacks, and after a while, that dream fades, fade away. Sometimes we lose someone close to us. We lose a, a, a co-worker who, whom you're counting on, or perhaps some setbacks and some disappointment, or, or some blockages just come in that, that, that just, just kind of put you in, in, in a trap. And the Lord just set you free right now. And the Lord said to you, I love you. I forgive you for whatever failures in your past. But this is the new beginning. So Lord, deposit that dream. Cause them to dare to dream again. And Lord, I pray that in the weeks to come, you're going to put dreams in their heart for every area of their life. And they will walk into the abundance that God you have given to them. And then I pray that they will become extreme disciples, willing to lay it all out so that they will drink of the living water that is fresh, that never runs dry. The Lord bless you. The Lord calls you to dream about yourself. And you're going to see that beginning to happen in the coming year. Because God is giving Singapore a second chance. God is giving FCBC a second chance. And the Lord wants us to rise up again. Learning from the mistakes of the past, but rising up and say, God, we are going to see your kingdom come. Father, thank you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's thank the Lord. Those in... Uh, Sun Tech to thank the Lord. God bless you. You are dismissed. Turn to a few people and say, we're going to dream God's dream together. Shall we say that? Turn to a few people and say, we're going to dream God's dream together.